Hey, everybody, we're going to pick up our conversation we started last week. So if you haven't listened to last week's episode, go back and listen to that episode, and then you can listen to this episode. This is part two of a two-part series. Uh, I hope you enjoy. Welcome to The Friday Habit with Mark Labriola and Benjamin Manley. The Friday Habit is for small business owners, freelancers, and creatives who are ready to take their business to the next level. Join us as we discover how to apply the strategies we learn to grow our businesses, make more money, and live every day like it's Friday. And then finally, by the time we got to the end of 2021, I just said, you know what, you're going to have to, you, you are going to have to claw this four day work week from my cold dead hands because it is so good <laughs> for our company from a numbers perspective and from a perspective of what it was doing with my staff. It also is an incredible differentiator when people are trying to figure out where they want to work. It's a mm-hmm. really big value add. It's a huge reason when I do my annual conversations with every member of my staff. I get one-on-one with everybody. And the number one thing that they will say when I ask, like, how would you convince someone to work at Here Comes the Guy? What's the, you know, what's kind of the first thing that pops in your mind? Well, they're like, the, I mean, obviously the four-day work week is a huge thing. There's a lot of other things, but that's huge. And so the value that it has added and the fact that I can see in the numbers our increase in productivity Mm. makes me so glad that we took the chance. And that's really, when people ask me how, if if I'm interested in doing it, I'm scared to do it. The best way to do it is to try it out for finite periods of time, communicate radically authentically about the fact that this is an experiment and let people know the metrics you need to see in order to keep it going. Like, radical authenticity and transparency with all of my staff. They're all owners. So I treat them like adults and say, look, we either, if if we hit this, we'll keep doing it. If it doesn't work, we're going to go back to the way, you know, it worked before. And, and everyone decided, you know what, we really want to make this work. Do you have anybody monitoring your email or phone on Fridays, just in case? Like, do you have anybody that does that and like switch their fourth day to a different day? Or you just say, hey, you know, we're closed on Fridays. Yeah, we make a really big deal at Here Comes the Guide about our core values and about how we run our company and how it's different than a lot of companies. And so all of us have really strong out of office messages that just say, you know, you've reached us on Friday and guess what? We work a four day work week and here's why. And our clients have absolutely loved it. We have not had a single client complain, hey, I couldn't reach this person. It hasn't happened a single time. Oh, wow. Love that. That's pretty cool. What um? So the other thing with uh, you, you have the four day work week, and then is it right that you guys also are fully remote? Yes, we've been fully remote since twenty sixteen. Yeah. Okay, so that's interesting too. It, at some point, like up until then, you had a physical space in somewhere in California that like, we was did. an office that everyone went into every day. Well, we had been moving towards being remote for a long time, so we had had employees who'd started with us in Berkeley and then, you know, one of them had, you know, their husband took a job at a big university. Another one, their husband was in the military and they needed to move, but they didn't want to leave. Here comes the guide. And so we just started slowly setting people up to work remotely. And that helped me to understand how I wanted to set the company up. And I knew again, that that was a direction that I really wanted us to go. I Profit matters so much to me it matter the the amount of profit matters so much more to me than our just direct line revenue and so the overhead that we were paying for that office just to come in to the office <laughs> it just made absolutely no sense to me and so it it made so much more sense for me to take the time to really figure out how to run a fully remote office and a fully remote company rather than trying to hold on to the notion that I needed people to be in front of me for me to know that they were being productive. That just never made sense to me. So uh, how, how has that worked then? I hear you keep saying about your core values. I would love to hear what your, your core values are. Like if you have them like a list of them, I do. Like I would love to hear what those are. And then 
I guess it, it almost breaks my brain to think like, all right, well, how do you create like culture and all these other kind of things if you aren't physically with those other people, right? If you're not getting lunch once a week or, you know, stopping by someone's office and chatting for, you know, 30 minutes or whatever, like, you know, how, how do you, how do you build that culture? And it sounds like, I mean, you've been doing that for since 2016, which is, you know, crazy too. Right. So there are a lot of things that go into building a culture of connectedness. And so the first thing I would say, whether it's how do you hire people who are going to work hard enough to make a four day work week work, or how do you hire people who are going to work well remotely, or how do you hire people to, to have that core connectedness? And I think it all goes back to who you hire. We hire for the skills and abilities that that and and natural proclivities that make someone a good fit in the culture of Hopscotch Press, which is our corporate name. And so we it it starts there, right? It starts with a plan. I think it would be so much harder to go in and take a company that works only in an office and then say, okay, everybody go home and let's try to make this. I think it would be so much harder because you haven't mm. hired people who are specifically really good at maintaining their own, who are their own worst boss internally, yeah. right? My people are harder on themselves than I could ever be. I hire people who care so much about their own personal part of the lift that they're lifting for the company way more than they care about what I think about their work. Okay. So then what are, what are some of those questions that you ask, you know, when someone, when you're interviewing somebody to find out if they have that particular, you know, work file, you mentioned the Enneagram one, you know, here at Brand Viva, I have everyone take the Enneagram test so that I can understand a little bit better um, as a boss to communicate with them or understand their motivations of why they do certain things, you know, mm -hmm. but like, do you put people through a personality test before they start or, you know, what kind of things are you looking for as a leader um, when you're hiring somebody that, you know, like, okay, they'll be self-motivated, they'll be self-regulating and they can be self-accountable, you know, working from, you know, home four days a week. Mm -hmm. Sounds so radical. Right. It does, it yeah, you get some of the look on your face. You do seem really <laughs> dubious about whether or not it's possible. But well, yeah, because I think we come from the the like there's an element of I guess it's just an element of trust that you have to have, right? And I think that the world is going through this shift and we're even seeing it with other clients and and people that we interact with 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 our companies that we interface with and how that there's the upper level, like the C-suite, right? They want to see butts in seats and they want to make sure that they're getting their 40 hours worth of, of, of work out of somebody because they're paying a salary and doing all these other kind of things. But then you have the employee, which has during COVID and the year or two after that, that just really love that autonomy and freedom. And, you know, we're still able to be productive, but I think there's an element of like, there's an element of faith or trust that you just have to have in your people. But again, I think like what you're saying, if you hire people specifically knowing that this is going to be the environment they're going to be in, then you'll, maybe is it a longer hiring process? I mean, <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. There's a lot that you just said yeah, there's that, a lot there, that, I that I could respond to. Okay. Sounds let like me another start podcast, with... uh, just all about hiring. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was, <laughs> was going to say, I could, yeah. So, First of all, what I would say is, I think, here's here's my spicy take. Any C-suite person who is measuring in, an employee's efficacy by whether or not that employee's butt is in his seat has got it completely wrong as to how to measure value of an employee. And so what that leads me to is there needs to be something better. There needs to be a better way to say, am I getting the value that I'm paying for from this employee? And that leads me to the next thing, which is trust, but verify. And those two pieces are what make it possible to manage a fully remote team. And so I, I hire for people who are naturally built to perform because they that's what they do intrinsically. I hire people who care a lot about their piece of 
the the sisterhood that we are a part of and not letting anybody else down. Nobody on my team wants to be the weakest link. They don't want to let their team down. I hire people for whom that is really, really important. And then once I hire them and train them really, really well, and they've kind of been, you know, what we call released into the wild, we have KPIs, key performance indicators for every single role. And every one of those things is something that I can trust, but verify. So when I create the roles in my company, I make sure I know what success looks like and build metrics so that I can see that. None of those metrics have anything to do with, were you moving your mouse every blah, 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 or were you, I've never put a single piece of software on a single computer to to verify, is somebody there? Because if I'm trying to verify, are you there then I don't have your KPI right. I don't have the ability to verify that I'm getting the value from you as an employee. And if I'm not doing that, then guess what? You can't feel that I understand your value. And if you don't feel that I understand your value, you're very quickly going to become disconnected from what we're trying to do. So all of it works together in this really virtuous circle. But as we've seen over and over again, also it all breaks down into a vicious cycle when we start trying to monitor and manage in ways that treat people like they're robots or like all that matters is if they move a mouse or put their butt in the seat. That's not what we're here for. We all want to be doing work that matters and work that brings value to where we're all trying to go. And it's so much more than just, am I sitting here? It's, it's like, what, what is each one of my people doing? Do they understand what their piece, how it plays into where we're all trying to go? Have I delivered my vision to the company and to the individual so that she understands, okay, this is why it matters that I do what I do really well four days a week. Do you have any examples of roles where it was hard to create a KPI, but, you know, some of them feel a little vague or maybe a little bit like, oh, this might be hard to measure, like customer happiness or something like that. Are there any examples of ones where you found it challenging to create a KPI, but then you found solutions to it? That's a good question. The vast majority of my staff works with our clients, our venues, our leadership team probably would fall into that category. The, we have, I have a small leadership team of of just six, but we are in a tremendous amount of communication with each other. And also we have, I don't know, have you guys ever heard of the, uh, the business operating system called traction? Yeah. Or EOS? Uh, Yes. Yep. Okay, so we run our company on EOS, and that system holds us all to a very high level of accountability. We all, the leadership team, everyone knows every quarter, here's what my goals are, am I on track or off track from those goals? Mm -hmm. So that shines a really bright light of accountability that makes it really easy to get a sense of where are we putting our focus and how close are we to where we want to be? This quarter, this year, this three years, this 10 years. That makes sense. Do you have any uh, examples of KPIs that you have given to other team members? I'd be curious, like what what's a good example of a KPI that makes sense? You know, like you said, not measuring clicks or is somebody in their seat, but, you know, what is it? Is it a number of clients that you closed? Is it, you know, what, what might be a, a good KPI? Sure. So one thing that's really important with every KPI that we set, it's that it has to be something that is fully in the control of the employee. So if I were to set, let's say, number of clients that you've closed, that's not fully in the control of the employee, right? Because the client has to decide to say yes so that they can close that client, right? So we have... so. Are, we have a you know tremendous sales force. They do not work on commission. They, everyone is on, everyone is on salary, and we all split the profit at the end of the year. And so, they are tasked with not working a certain number of hours. They're tasked with making sure that they have that they're doing 
a set number of reaches every day. That might be by email, that might be on the phone, that might be using a, a tool called Loom that we use a lot to to put video with a, an, a presentation. And each one of those reaches, they're fully in control of how many of those they do in a day, right? They're reaching out to the client. So we measure efficacy in how many of the, we, we have set numbers and it's based on a lot of different things. It's a very bespoke, we have a very bespoke way of setting those KPIs based on their area, based on their client count. There's any number of, of things that go into that. And so we're measuring are they do are they getting to the number of reaches that we want and are those reaches high enough quality are they the way we want to sell to our clients that's a those are two examples of a KPI for for one of our salespeople, for example so it's measurable and it's fully in their control makes a lot of sense yeah it does, it does really okay so you just mentioned that none of your salespeople are on commission they're, right they're just straight salary Yep. That's also interesting. I'm uh, just blowing your mind right and left, Mark. I know. Seriously. It's like, boosh, like I was like, wait a second. How, do you, how are you doing this? Um, so again, again, right. It probably just comes down to somebody who is passionate about like a lifestyle and passionate about the company. And, um, well, but did you miss the part where I said that we split the profit at the end of the year? Yeah, so there's that too. Yeah, there's that too. So we look at what did we make? What did we spend? We fund our ESOP depending on how much we need to do that. And then the rest of it is split equally amongst the employees. Really? No matter how long you've been here, no matter if you're in production, you're a salesperson, it doesn't matter because we are only going to get where we need to go if every single person's value is equally measured. So salespeople in a lot of organizations, the salespeople get a lot of spotlight, right? They get a lot, their salary structure's different. They get the big trips, they get whatever, because they're the ones bring. But then what happens, there's all of these other people who have to do all of the work to create the structure. Right to give the value to the client. So we weigh everything completely equally. We're all owners, so we split the profit equally. That makes sense. And I like that simplicity too. Yeah, yeah, it does. It makes it very like simple. It's hard to argue against that fair. Yeah, it's very cool. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, right. So um, I'd love to go back to your to your values and then just hearing how you maintain a culture, you know, being fully remote, you know, are you like hopping on big Zoom calls once a week with everybody and giving them the rah-rah and, you know, whatnot? Or what, what does that look like? Okay, so we have 12 core values. Do you want... Do you, do you want me to read 12 let's, core values? We got time. Just let's, okay. I, I, <laughs> All right. I just, I want to give you good I, tape. I hear, so... <laughs> yeah, I want to hear these, tw these 12 values. All right. All right. I will, I will tell you what our 12 values are. Okay. All right. So the sisterhood first always is our number one core value. Everything okay. we do is about that. Okay. I'm going to pause right here. I'm going to stop you just because one question you, cause you kind of have alluded to this, the sisterhood. Okay. Yep. So you're a fully uh, female owned and run company. Now, is that like, was that a choice or does it mostly just women who are interested in, in wedding stuff? I think it started out that way, and now it's become a choice. Okay. And so a guy couldn't work there. No, that's not to say that. It's not to say that we, we I, don't, I don't know the last time that a guy applied at Here Comes the okay. Guy. Yeah, to yeah, be yeah. honest, I it think is Marcus, our wedding. Marcus right. thinking about applying, I think, is what's happening. I'm like, right. <laughs> Uh, let's say part of the sisterhood yes let's say if that if that ever happened we're not going to close ourselves off to the notion of it if that ever happened we would yeah. we would find a different name for our group but that's what we've yeah. that's what yeah, we've yeah, always that makes sense. called it but the 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 kind of ethos behind it is that th what we're trying to do is to create the company that we've always thought should exist in the world a mm. great place for women to work where they can be their best selves in their career and they also can be a whole person outside of work. So we have tons of, not, not all of us, tons of us are moms. If one of our babies gets sick, 
absolutely no one at Here Comes the Guide is going to give you crap because you couldn't come in because your baby is sick. What they're going to do is they're going to hop on what we call the hoppy break room and they're going to give you advice as to what to do with that fever and this and, you know, here here's what I did. Here's what this. And so for a mom to be able to rest in the fact that she works with a bunch of other moms yeah. who completely get what she's going through mm-hmm. is incredibly empowering. Yeah. I, I I was just having this conversation with somebody the other night where, you know, society was telling, you know, women that they get all their fulfillment from being, getting a job and being the, you know, the breadwinner and maybe foregoing a family to have success, you know, and then they reach this pinnacle and they forego the family. And then they're in their late thirties, early forties, like, wait a second, like, Maybe I, I find some fulfillment in that and I got all this thing that I thought would fulfill me, but I'm not fulfilled because I feel like our society has been a this or that, you know, like you can't have both. You know, you have to be a high powered businesswoman and no family and, you know, burning the midnight oil or you have to be a stay at home mom and you can't, you know, work a job. And so um, it seems like you're kind of changing that and proving out a model to say, hey, this can work. You know, and you can have both. Exactly. You can have both if you want to have both. We certainly have lots of people who are opting not to have children. And I think that is an incredibly valid choice. Yeah. But if you want to have both, you, d- you it, I do think it's possible. But I think it's only possible if your work environment is saying that you as a as a mom that that is a positive that that is a superpower of yours there's very there's there's few animals on the planet that can do more in less time than a working mom yeah and so that you know they they are just we are so incredibly powerful and if you harness that properly in an environment that allows them to feel allows us to feel that we are our best selves, it can be really powerful. So the sisterhood is a lot about people with all different lifestyles, again, not just moms, all different lifestyles, all different life choices who are coming together to be the best version of themselves. And that's, so the sisterhood first always, everything I do from the beginning of my day to the end of the day is to protect that first and foremost. Because if that's protected, if the sisterhood is working the way that it should, ev- all the power radiates from that center. So our second value is relationships before sales. So we have a no commission salary structure specifically so that we can have relationships with our clients instead of the end all be all result we're looking for be to create an invoice for them. We we say we'll always do what's best for the couple. Every decision we make on our website is to make it as easy as possible for the couple to find their perfect wedding venue. Our client's success is our success. So whenever our clients are successful, whatever brings them to that success, that's what we care about. Listen well, make it better. Sometimes a coworker or a client or a couple just need to be heard and we're big believers in just listening and making it better. We say laugh often and wear yoga pants anytime you feel like it. You can be powerful in Viore joggers, just like you can in a power suit. Uh, don't meet goals, exceed them. We're incredibly goal-driven. Everything is figure outable. We've talked about that one. Yeah. Work-life balance makes good business sense. We've talked a lot about that. Number 10 is you don't need to be under one roof to be together. So we don't, we've chosen not to have the uh, expense of an office, but we do spend money and, and time in order to feel together. We can come back to that. Number 11 is be fearlessly authentic. We've touched a little bit on that. And then number 12 is we work like you own the company because you do. So those are our core values to return to, you don't need to be under one roof to be together. We, so we have several things that we do to create a sense of community. Again, we hire people for whom being a part of that community is something that they really, really want and need. That's something that feels really good to them. They're girls, girls, right? Yeah. Also, we do an annual retreat that we spend a huge amount of money on to bring everybody together. I'm in Austin, Texas. And so we've been doing that 
um, here, my COO lives three doors down from me. We bring everybody here to Austin and we have a really good time for four straight days. Absolute time of connection. We have so much fun. We work together. We talk. We eat together. We make meals together. We get in small groups. We get in larger groups. We make and goals for the year. We spend that time um, together really, really intentionally. During the regular work week, we plug people in in a lot of different ways. We've created several, each employee is a is a part of several different groups, whether it's their work team that they're they're doing actual work in. We have what's called hoppy houses. Again, our corporate name is Hopscotch Press, so we call each other hoppies. So we have hoppy houses that are um, times for us to just get together and shoot the shit. So you, so we can just get together in that way. We have uh, what we've called pod meetings, where we bring people from all the different channels of work roles to brainstorm client problems. So we brainstorm them together. So you know, I do book clubs with different employees where we're reading through a book together and we get together and talk about it. We do boots trips, boots on the ground, where we get together and, and actually go visit venues in small groups. So lots of different ways. And then, of course, we do, we do you know, big groups together where we will, yeah. you know, we'll all do yoga. We'll all build a terrarium. We'll all, you know, we, we take turns organizing just fun stuff that we do together virtually, but all together. So it's a mm. lot of different things, a lot of different ways that we want to try to keep here comes the guide feeling small. Yeah. How do you, now I don't want to stereotype, but I, I've, I've had some friends who've had, you know, companies that are just all females, you know, and sometimes there would be some bickering or, you know, fighting or, you know, jealousy, all these other kind of things, you know, which is a little bit different than what men struggle with. You know, I would say as far as, um, some of those types of things we struggle with different, you know, things. Um, but I, how have you kept that as far as like low drama? Right. So it's a really, really good question. It's a valid question. So we, again, I'm going to say it again. It goes back to the hiring process. During the hiring process, we talk a lot about relationships. We talk, we ask them to describe their best friend to us. We, you know, we talk a lot about their kind of place in the world and have they ever worked in an all-female environment? What has happened that's been good and what has happened that's been difficult? Be surprised how much information you can unearth from asking those questions in an interview. And so it starts with hiring uh, women who are really wanting to be in this kind of environment. And then during the interview process and all during the training process, we say over and over again, there are two ways to get fired immediately at Hopscotch Press. And I mean immediately. There are other ways to, you know, maybe you need some work on this. And we rehabilitate. We get a, you know, we're going through a process. There are two ways to get fired immediately. Number one, lie to me. A single time. That'll get you fired. Number two, create any kind of drama. You will be fired immediately. It is my number one role as CEO of Here Comes the Guide to make sure that threat is always ready, willing, and able to be fired on. So that- And have you had to act on that? I have. Wow. There is, so we talk a lot about what drama looks like. We talk a lot about what constructive- in a constructive relationship, how to work through conflict. Because every relationship, every relationship has conflict. That's normal. What's important is that we have responsible comfort, conflict resolution that means we are baking into the sisterhood instead of taking from the sisterhood. Mm. And so we talk a lot and get really specific about what that looks like so that there's not a sense of like, I had no idea that that was going to get me fired. Like we get really, really granular, granular. We get really clear because it is the slipperiest of slopes. It is the slip. If I let even a little bit of it happen, we'll lose it. I, I love that so much. I literally have never 
it's not about that being a fireable offense. I don't think people would ever think of that being a fireable offense, but that is probably one of the smartest things you could do to keep your culture solid. Like that is such a good idea. Yeah, it, it's it it absolutely is the glue that holds us together because mm. what it means is we have a group of people who always assume positive intent on the part of their sisters, right? They always assume positive intent. And they always take enough responsibility to say, hey, we need to talk a little bit more about what happened because I'm kind of having some feelings about it and we need to talk it through and we mm -hmm. need to be radically authentic with each other about how we're feeling. 99% of stuff can get dealt that way. If it can't, then their other option is to come to me and to say, hey, th this work dynamic or this situation, I'm having some issue. That's okay too. What's not okay is to go to another person and start talking about it. Yeah, that's that's really good. And with a team of, you know, like you said, like 42 people, I could see that getting out of control, you know, easily when, yeah, if you just start talking bad about somebody or whatever it might be, that's, that's such a good way to handle it. Mm. Yeah. So how long is your onboarding and hiring like process? Like how many interviews does somebody go through and then like, what does that onboarding look like? Right. So it's a an or it's it's an application process online followed by a phone conversation, followed by three video interviews, and then there's three different kinds of testing within that. It's like harder to get into like Stanford or harder to get into to to uh here you know, here comes the guide than it is to get into Stanford or like some Ivy League school. Right. Right. And I mean, I can tell you that we, the, the last time we went out to hire, we got over a thousand applications and we hired two people. Wow. wow. So it's, it can be frustrating because sometimes I'll feel like, am I being too picky? Yeah. But then I look at my team and I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not too picky. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's working. You built this culture. And, and again, like 44 people is, I mean, that's a decent amount of people. And to keep that like passion and excitement and cooperation and, um, you know, love for what someone does like at a high level, it's like you, you need it to be that picky of a process to keep, keep it growing and, and, um, you know, moving forward. I mean, my, one of my first retail jobs was for Apple you know, back in like 2007 and they had a very rigorous hiring process, but it was because they had a particular culture that they wanted to maintain at Apple and a particular passion that they wanted each person to have. And so same thing, they got tons and tons of applications, but only accepted, you know, a very few amount of people, but it kept the energy great and people always excited. And, it, you know, it was, I always say it was, you know, one of the best cultures that I was a part of, you know, back in the early retail days of Apple. Um, and it, you know, some of my things that I carry as far as values, um, like surprise and delight, you know, came from them, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, I get it. Right. And, you know, we create the company that we want to create, right? I mean, it, you mm -hmm. have to, as a CEO, you have to figure out what it is that you want out of the day-to-day -day exercise of running your company. If you're growing it to sell it, that's its own that creates its own kind of list of things that you need to do. If you're, yeah. you know, there's there, there's lots of different end games that you might have. But for me, I'm looking to create a company that will be here long after I am, that will be a great place for women to work and feel really whole and heard and valued. And in order to do that, I want to care about and, and want to be with the people that I'm working with all day long. Like, I want to like them. I want to, yeah. I want to care about what happens to them. I want to, mm -hmm. I want to help them grow to be the best version of themselves. And so at the end of the day, being picky ends up making all of our lives easier and it ends up making us a whole lot happier than just hiring really quickly and hoping for the best. Yeah. This has been one of my favorite podcast episodes in three years. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I agree, Mark. I was thinking the same thing. 
This is super fun. I have just received so much value from this. I, I my mind is exploding right now. And I'm gonna like <laughs> go back and listen to this episode and like just try to milk it for all the knowledge that has been delivered. So well, and you know, you're welcome to follow our careers page and apply anytime, Mark. We would love, <laughs> we would love to have you. All right. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> well, hey, we always like to leave people with some takeaways. So Ben, you know, there, there's probably too much to recap here, but just give me your top five from this conversation. Uh, what, what were some of the top, uh, the things you, you pulled away? Yeah, I'll try to make it quick. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned a story at the beginning about how you got involved in the company really made me think how valuable it is to stay in touch with people and share your values and that you'd like to work with in the future because you never know what might happen because this whole story is because you did that. Yep. Um, and also I think, I really liked the uh, point you made about when you grow very quickly, it's a lot easier to risk losing a great culture you built. Um, I like your point about hiring people expect more from themselves than you do. When it comes to working with remote employees, you need to trust first, but also verify. Uh, and then I, even though it's a lot of homework, you know, and it might sound hard, I'm sure there's ways to figure it out because everything's figure outable and you should be able to create KPIs for every single role in the company. And I love that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. If you could leave our audience with just one action item for next week to start to say, hey, like if you want to start to to grow a better business or build better culture, this is the one thing you should start next week. What I would say is if if the person I'm talking to is the CEO or the person you know who, who owns the business, make sure you can answer the question, why am I doing what I'm doing with this? What am I trying to accomplish with this company? If you can answer that question, then you can build everything out and get where you want to go. If you can't answer that question, you might be feeling muddled and confused and like you're just spinning in circles. So that that would be my best advice. Okay, then if you are spinning in circles, what's the next step? then you need to figure out your why you need to start with, like Simon Sinek says, you need to start right. with your why go read Simon Sinek's book, start with why <laughs> and, okay. and really, and really think about what is it? What's the result I'm looking for from this company? What am I trying to build? And guess what? Spoiler alert it is not whatever your product is. Mm. Okay. Where can people connect with you, follow you, find more about your company and all that kind of stuff? Right. You can find us at herecomestheguide.com. You can go to our, our careers page if you want to follow there. When we have open positions, you can find me at Meredith Monday Schwartz on Instagram. And then you have a podcast too, right? You do book reviews. I do. I do a podcast called Currently Reading. We talk about the books that we're, that we're reading. We have such a good time doing it. That's awesome. That's so great. All right. Well... Thanks so much for listening to The Friday Habit. If you go to thefridayhabit.com, there you'll find show notes for this episode. There you can also find all sorts of great stuff. And if you scroll to the bottom of the page, uh, you can download our guide to The Friday Habit system that will show you how to spend more time working on your business than in your business. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review in the Apple Podcasts app. If you have a question or topic you'd like us to cover, don't forget to record a quick voice memo and send it to hello at fridayhabit.com. That's right. Thanks for listening to The Friday Habit. And remember, live every day like it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs>